In our last video, we looked at the details of how the blades mount. Now there was something I forgot to do, which comes back to the whole idea of the way that they mount, which is sort of demonstrate what I was thinking in a more concrete way. So let's start with that. The idea is that this blade would need to easily slide on and off of this part of the bike. I mean, the machine may need to replace this at some point, and it would just need to have this blade fall off. It doesn't have a human around to wiggle it and, and pry it off. So if it's damaged even slightly, it could pose a problem. So my, my potential solution to this is to have it sort of loosely fit so that falling off is almost intentional. But have the machine actually possess the ability to grab the blade. And I'm thinking that it would do this with a motion like this. So the blade would slide on and then it would sort of angle these out to hold it in place and just grab it right there. And that that pressure would keep it in place until it's done with it, at which point it would relax these and this would presumably simply fall off. That also got me thinking about something else. In the novel, um, there's a lot of references to the blades spinning around, almost spinning around constantly, similarly to how a swordsman would twirl a sword on the end of his hand, just using his fingers to keep it in balance as he twirls it around as like an, sort of an intimidation technique. I was thinking about how we could do that with these. And it got me thinking, if the uh, if the blade is short enough so that it doesn't touch the motor da down here like it does right now, we could actually have these blades simply spin around and around like this. And that in turn got me thinking, well, if they did that, they would probably have a balance issue. Unless we had a counterbalance. So I think a counterbalance lobe here would be a pretty cool um, feature. And that would enable the blades to spin around and around as long as we made the blade short enough so that it can do that. So if we were to take this blade and scale it down just a little bit on the y-axis so that it clears that gap, we can actually accomplish that. So it's a tight squeeze, but it works. Now the next step that we need to do to make this a reality is to take the plate that the blade is mounted on, currently just a cube primitive, and modify it a bit. We could make it editable, and then go to the side view, and just as sort of a simple gesture to remind us that we're doing this, we can select that face on the end, extrude it, and similarly to the crankshaft lobe on, a, on an automobile, we can add some extra weight by extruding material away from it. Now, to make this look stylish as well, we can give a little bit more bias to one side, and what we're doing is trying to figure out the center of gravity here. It doesn't have to be perfect, we just need to sell the idea that this is intentionally larger. We can probably do that by rounding this edge, like that. Rounding this edge here as well. And then pulling it away, so that it's clearly meant to counterbalance. Once the counterbalance purpose has sort of been established by the size of it, we can then go in here and keep beveling. So we can bevel that down so it's a little softer on that edge, likewise here. And then we can select this edge and that edge and bevel both of those. If we go back to our perspective view, we can see that we do have sort of a counterbalance look. And it, it doesn't look great, I'll have to say. Maybe we can streamline it a little bit more. And this is something that in reality would need to be quite large, but maybe we can keep it with this sort of miniature hockey stick look. 
and get away with it in terms of the story. Maybe it's maybe it has a lead core or something that makes it much heavier than it looks. But with this idea, perhaps this could be a stepper motor. The reason a stepper motor sounds really appealing to me is because it can be held in place. Um, a, a stepper motor is the kind of motor that's likely used in a printer. It sort of advances the paper. If you think of those older printers that were able to uh, roll the paper just a little bit and then roll it back. Those are using stepper motors because stepper motors are pretty cool because they have positional awareness. They can rotate themselves to 90 degrees, stop, rotate themselves back to 45, stop, and then rotate back to 90. The downside is that they're a little bit noisy, not very efficient, and kind of slow. So what I was thinking is that if this were a stepper motor, it would allow this arm to do things like this, sort of do positional changes where it knows what point it's at. But then if we were to disengage the stepper motor, maybe it could just allow the blades to swing freely. And if these arms are pointed out like this with perhaps the large arm extended and the small arm extended a little bit as well, if the goal was to intimidate by swinging these blades around, this would do a pretty good job at it. And this would probably work a little bit better if our pivot was low down like this. And potentially the machine could be approaching something with these blades out and swinging. So that's pretty much how I envision the mechanics of these blades working. Uh, I hope that's how Mr. Suarez envisioned it. That's that's really been one of my challenges throughout this process is is doing doing his vision justice. Uh, again, what I'm talking about right now is the book that all of this is based on. It's a techno thriller series called Damon, and it's essentially about a evil genius who dies and leaves behind computer programs and robots to do his bidding. That sounds really cheesy, but the book paints it in a very realistic light, and it's one of those books that makes you a little bit terrified and a little bit excited about the future at the same time. You should definitely check it out. So we now have what we think our blades would look like. Uh, sorry, our arms would look like. We, don't actually, we haven't actually discussed the look and feel of the blades. Although one of the uh, one of the guys I work with is a bit of a sword enthusiast, and I chatted with him really briefly about this uh, project, and what he had to say was pretty interesting. You know, he mentioned that if these machines are going to be hacking and slashing, they're probably not going to want a thin precision blade like the one I have right now. You know, this is more like what a samurai would use. Very. Uh, um, Sorry, not a not a samurai, but a ninja. Very short, very precise. Not a lot of weight at the tip. And this got me thinking that maybe the kind of blade we should be using is something more like a machete, um, or or sort of sort of like a. Uh, I'm not really good at swords, so I don't know the terminology, but sort of like a pirate's sword, where the the end of the blade is very large and heavy, because that way momentum is on its side. But because of this issue here with the counterbalance and the way that we're spinning blades around, I think I'm going to stick with these slender precision blades. Uh, they seem to be pretty good for stabbing and such, um, slicing, and I guess that's what this machine is about. So if we were to polish these blades a little bit, no pun intended, what would they look like? So the first thing we need to do is taper them a little bit. Right now they're the same thickness all the way around. I'm assuming that in real life a blade would taper towards the end. So perhaps we can squeeze this in a little bit. 
and then go to the end points and squeeze them in too. And that gives me more of a taper. Uh, we can then add some more geometry because we're really lacking geometry here. These are just proxy objects. So I'm going to slide this edge. And then select an edge loop or two. And then we can use our bevel tool just to add some more geometry in there, maintaining that curve. And we also need some more geometry right here, because right now it's a sharp edge, but it would probably be more rounded like that. Now because we have an odd number of edges now, we should really add an edge to this base part. The easiest way to do that, making the edge straight, is just from the side view. So we can just go to the side view, select the knife tool, use line mode, do not restrict to selection, and make sure visible only is unchecked. That way it'll let us cut right through the object. And there we go. We just cut right through the object, making yet another point. And we can now maintain this as quads. Quads, of course, being quadrangles. I've been talking a lot about quads in the past few videos. Now, this sword would still need an edge. Thankfully, this part is pretty easy in 3D. All we need to do is select the part of the blade that's supposed to be sharpened. Again, this is a really primitive way of doing things. And we can simply squeeze it down until we have an edge. Now our blade is actually dangerous. So I'm just going to zoom in on this part right here, select that edge. I'd like to say thanks to Cinema 4D's new precision when working at these small dimensions. Previously that was a bit of a challenge, but with the latest version they've sort of fixed that. And now these blades look a little bit more scary. So if we turn off lines, we can now see that the blades actually have a bit of a shape and structure to them. Although now they're very thin. I think they may be too thin. So what we can do is just increase the overall thickness of them. And I'm going to align the axis here. Oh, the axis is pretty well aligned with the end of the blade. So you can leave the axis alone. But like I said, what I will do is make them thicker. So this way the back edge of them is really thick and heavy. And the front edge of them is still very thin. So they look damaging, but substantial at the same time. And of course, because I'm using instances, all of these changes were transposed to the blades that are actually mounted on the machine. And it looks like my changes from my demonstration earlier didn't save. I probably hit the undo key too many times. So I'm just going to select these and adjust their banking until they're pointed out, like my plan. And we're starting to get closer to the blades that we envisioned. Most of my videos are really long, so let's, let's try to make this one short. So the other thing that I was looking at is this orb. I really don't like how it looks right now. It looks kind of ridiculous. It looks like the motorcycle has a nose. Um, I was thinking of ways to remedy this. If we were to put this off to one side, it might help. But I think the thing that might help the most is to increase the size of this base. So if we made this base much taller, so that it sort of encompassed it more like that, I think that might give us more of the look we were going for. And if we also extended it to have loops here that hold the turret in place and start of start of uh, sort of start fleshing this object out, it might give us a better look. So let's do that right now. We can do that quickly. I'm just going to hit the C key to convert to editable. And again, in Cinema 4D, when you convert a sphere to polygons, the top part doesn't stay connected. So we need to select all and go to optimize and we optimize points polygons and use points with a tolerance of 0.004 inches we can then do a line loop cut about there 
and select this loop of edges, loop of polygons, I'm, I mean, we can then extrude just a little bit. And we now have something else to extrude. So if we select these four faces on either side, we can then use control drag to move them up like that. And we can then select these edges on the ends. And we can just drag those down so that we have that curved profile we're looking for. We, we want to avoid scaling them because they're on a curve like this. If we were to scale them, we would actually change the path of them so they would cut into there. But if we just keep to moving them uh, along the z-axis, we're probably not going to do anything to them that would change their appearance. And we can also select these edges here on the top. I didn't mean to select that one, I just want these two. And we can then move it up so it's curved a little bit. What we're left with is something that looks a little bit more like a turret and less like a nose. So I'm just looking at these points and if I were to move these points a little bit it would probably help sell the effect. So moving to where my geometry is I can move these upwards like that. Maybe I can scale these out a little bit. Yeah, this is this is sort of an exception to what I was just talking about because they're right on the edge and they're causing some issues with the smoothing. On second thought, if they're causing issues with the smoothing, let's just change the smoothing. Change that to like 45 degrees. There we go. So this is looking a lot more Sorry, the rotation flipped out on me. So this is looking a lot more calculated. Um, but it does stick out a lot. Let's try to make it more streamlined. So we can move the sphere part of this flare, prox flare proxy, as well as all of this geometry we just created, more inwards. Easiest way to do that is to move the base of the cylinder up to meet them. And then to change how far the base of this cylinder goes. And then we can use L to move this. So it definitely is starting to look less like a nose and more like a piece of instrumentation. And once we add some more of the detail in there, the lenses and the pivots and such, I'm pretty sure it'll start to look more, more sound. But maybe some asymmetry will do us good. If we were to move this off to one side, It'll give us more room for the blinding lasers and scanning lasers. So I'm just going to move it off to one side. Like that. And we can then move this bracket to the side as well. So we get that look that I was going for. And we can also remove the fong shading on this object. Right now it's just sort of a angular bracket. It doesn't need any special treatment. Although we should probably extrude instead of simply moving at this point. Because we are messing with the geometry right here unintentionally. Uh, we can just delete these faces, use the bridge tool in edge mode, and fill these triangles. We can always come back to that later. And once we have this FLIR proxy adjusted a little bit, the machine is starting to take shape. It looks less like a nose and more like a siren, which I'm okay with. 
uh, siren can sort of look like a vision element. And I think this screencast puts us at about 20 minutes. And I'm going to leave it right there. This will be one of the shorter Razorback videos. And as always, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, let me know. If you think I'm doing some stuff wrong, let me know and I'll consider changing it. If you just want to give me feedback and say, hey, this is awesome, or hey, this sucks, then let me know. I'd like to know what you think either way. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this, and until next time, bye.